Fire Emblem has practically always had its three basic physical weapon types that make up the weapon triangle, swords, lances, and axes. It also always has at least two weapon types that live outside that triangle, bows and magic. I already talked about bows in a different video, and axes got a video too, so I figure it's about time to take a look at magic and how it's changed throughout the series. I'll be mainly talking about tomes in this video, staves feel distinct enough that they'll get their own video someday, so as usual, let's start with FE1. FE1's magic is pretty interesting, and it establishes a lot of the standards for magic that stick around for a lot of the rest of the series. First, while swords, lances, axes, and bows in most cases can either only attack at one range or only attack at two range, almost all magic attacks in FE1 and most of the rest of the series can attack at one or two range, with the exception of siege tomes which attack at a very far range. Additionally, while physical weapons have their damage reduced by an enemy's defense stat, magic is reduced by resistance. In FE1 this is a really nice thing for magic users because most enemies do not have a lot of revs. This is also true of a lot of the rest of the series, although to a lesser extent. Even player units have pretty bad res in FE1, and with that in mind, magic looks pretty appealing. But it does have some noteworthy limitations. First, magic damage is fixed. When you attack with any physical weapon, a unit adds their strength stat to the might of their weapon to determine the damage dealt. However, magic users in FE1 don't add anything to their damage. If you attack with a 5 might fire tome, it's going to do 5 damage minus the enemy's res, regardless of the stats of your mage. The magic stat doesn't even exist yet. Depending on the situation, this can be a blessing or a curse. It's nice in that it can help mages feel pretty low investment, leveling them up won't increase their damage, so you can pull a mage off the bench and have them do acceptable damage with tomes. The only thing that matters offensively for them is their speed, which is helped by tomes like fire and thunder having low might, and also their hit, but this is again aided by tomes like fire having good hit naturally. However, damage being based just on tome might does make it difficult to do something like make a magic juggernaut, because they won't be able to one round everything. Unlike physical units who you can give more strength to, or give a strength stat booster, you can't do anything like that with mages. I think this is a good thing, 1-2 to two range juggernauting is not the most exciting to me, so I think it's good that mages have some limitations to make up for the fact that they get to attack at ranges other classes don't get to. The only thing that's kind of lame about this system is that it does limit the extent to which you can grow a mage. Leveling up mages is a little less exciting when you realize it's not going to change their offensive performance that much unless they hit a new doubling threshold from leveling up speed. Unlike other unit types, all you can really do to increase a mage's damage is to buy them a better tome. One effect of this is that durability of good tomes feels like a bigger deal in FE1 than most other games. My favorite mage, Merrick, comes with a personal tome called Excalibur with a whopping 13 might. That's awesome, and it actually lets him one round quite a few enemies. However, if you use it too aggressively, you can break it pretty easily. And for most of the game, there aren't readily available tomes with similar might. So breaking his Excalibur is a major cut to his damage. Physical units don't have this quite as bad, because if you really juice up a physical unit like Harden, when he runs out of, say, Silver Lance uses, he can probably still one-round lots of enemies with a regular Lance, because he will have gained strength by killing dudes with the Silver Lance, and he gets to add that to his damage. Mages are also kept in check in this game by ensuring that their classes do not provide them any horse or flying utility, and they get a promotion, but it doesn't show up until chapter 19, so no staffing on your mage until pretty late in the game if your name isn't Wendell or Boa. So, with that in mind, the primary use for magic in FE1 is against physically bulky enemies like generals and wyverns, where we can take advantage of their low res to deal a lot of damage with magic. A funny quirk of FE1 magic is that because units tend to have low or no res stats, tomes have relatively low might because they typically deal close to their full damage. This means that if a unit has a few points of res, they're very effective against mages compared to other units. And FE1 also gives us a couple res stat boosters in the form of talismans to work with, and they give you a tremendous 7 points of res for the unit you use them on. With that much resistance, a unit literally can't be hurt by fire, thunder, or blizzard tomes, and even enemies with better tomes will be doing pretty pitiful damage. So you get to select a couple units and make them immune to a significant portion of enemy mages for the rest of the game, just by handing them a talisman, which I think is pretty funny. Overall, I sort of like FE1's magic system, but it's far from my favorite. I like that it has guardrails that ensure that magic doesn't outshine physical units, and I like how the fixed damage and relatively uncommon access to really good physical 1-2 range combat 
makes magic feel pretty different than the other weapons in FE1. Unlike some other games where I feel like magic can start to feel pretty similar to other weapons but with a different coat of paint. Next up is Gaiden, and Fire Emblem Gaiden made some very significant changes to the magic formula, though it does keep some elements from FE1. Most offensive spells are 1-2 range, and you'll see a lot of familiar names of spells that work sort of how you would expect them to if you played FE1. However, everything else is pretty different. First, there are no tome items and no staves. Instead, units have individual spell lists, and if they're in a magic class, they can learn the spells on those lists. For example, at level 10, Gray learns Thunder if he's in a magic class. Not every unit learns every spell, and they don't learn the same spells at the same time. Gray may learn Thunder at level 10, but May starts with it. Celica learns it at level 8, and Delthea doesn't learn it at all. So depending on what mage you pick, you'll have access to different spells. Additionally, magic damage is no longer fixed. Units get to add their magic stat to their damage, so you have more of a chance to grow your magic units compared to FE1, where gaining levels didn't increase how much damage you could do outside of meeting doubling thresholds that you didn't previously. Since there are no Tome items in Gaiden, there's also no durability. Instead, each spell has an HP cost associated with it. So if you want to, say, cast Fire, it costs you 1 HP to do so. Then stronger spells tend to cost more. So Aura, which has 4 times Fire's Might, costs you 6 HP to cast. This, combined with mages tending to be on the squishier side, means you need to be a little careful with how you position your mages. If you cast a few spells and thus reduce your health, it's easy for your mage to get picked off by a random enemy you weren't paying attention to. Gaiden also introduced a couple new types of spell effects. First, Thunder is a 1-3 ranged spell, unlike the 1-2 ranged spells we've seen so far. And second, Seraphim has effective damage against monsters. Effective damage on spells is something that would be experimented more with in the next game and expanded on in the rest of the series. Although it's a big departure from FE1, I really like the way magic works in this game. More than any other game in the series besides its own remake, magic feels very unique and special compared to other weapons. I love the idea of spell lists as well, which can help differentiate different units in the same class. The health cost to spells works nicely, it's often not a huge deal, but having more powerful spells cost more health to cast ensures that there's still a reason to cast those lower level spells later in the game. The game also introduces some interesting new spells in the form of white magic, but those are basically this game's version of staves, so I'll talk about those in a staff video in the future. Next up, we have FE3, which is when magic is going to start looking pretty similar to the magic system we're familiar with today. We're back to tomes instead of learned spell lists, and mages get to add their strength to their damage, even in Book 1, which is a remake of FE1. This is a pretty big deal, but maybe not as big a deal as you might expect, because most mages have pretty low magic growths. Book 1 Merrick has just one base magic, for example, and a growth of 20%. And mages don't fare too much better in the stat department in Book 2. Still, this change does matter. It means your mages feel like they grow more than they did in FE1, and the occasional extra point or two of magic damage can be a big deal. For Merrick to one round the boss of Book 1 Chapter 7 without a crit, for example, he needs to gain a point of magic. Additionally, being able to benefit from the magic stat makes promotion feel like a bigger deal for mages, because it's a guaranteed extra 2 damage on every spell from the magic gain. FE3 also expands on FE2 introducing effective damage on spells by applying it to more of them. Excalibur is effective against Flyers now, which is huge for Merrick, it makes him one of your best Wyvern killers, and spells like Fire now get effectiveness against Ice Dragons, which is neat and flavorful. There are also just more tomes in FE3 than there were in FE1. Nosferatu appears here after being introduced in FE2, in this game it's a women's only tome that saps HP from enemies, and the Shaver tome is a Flyer effective tome that can be used by non-Merrick mages, so if you ever want to fight a Wyvern with someone other than Merrick, Shaver is a great addition to the game. FE3 is also just well designed for mages to excel. In Book 1, there are tons of armored bosses and wyverns that are surprisingly difficult to kill in one round, but mages, in particular Merrick with Excalibur, are a great way to do it. And in FE3 Book 2, we get Linda fairly early with her powerful Aura Tome that helps her make a great first impression. Even more so than in FE1, mages are the premier 1 2 range combat option in FE3. In FE1, javelins were relatively inaccurate, and in FE3 they remain inaccurate but also weigh their user down by 20. So if you want to miss a lot and never double, javelins are great. But if you actually want to hit your enemies at 1-2 range and maybe double them, you're going to have to turn to magic. I think FE3 has a pretty nice refinement of FE1's magic system. 
Allowing mages to benefit from a magic stat makes leveling them up more exciting, but keeping bases and growths low for magic makes it very unlikely that a mage is going to be your answer to everything. Because they probably won't have a particularly high magic stat, and they'll probably be pretty squishy compared to your physical units. I also really like the niche that PRF weapons provide to Merrick and Linda in this game. These limited but powerful tomes make them great armored unit killers or boss killers in certain situations, and it helps them stand out. They're both a lot less exciting without their PRF tomes, but if you're a little judicious with them, you can hold on to them for even important late game fights. And by the time you break the tomes, you probably are just pretty invested in the characters or have seen them gain a bunch of stats. So Linda and Merrick still feel pretty good, even if you don't manage to make it to Hamurn before their PRF tomes break. So this was a system I liked a lot in FE3, and it feels like a good baseline for what the magic system was going to become in the next several games. Before we get on to the next game though, while I may like FE3's magic system, I also like my Geckos and Skinks on Patreon. Special shout out to my Skinks, Wingman, Upscale Furry Trash, Lonely Voxel, Cosplay Sylveon, Ike Poo, Lucy Sev, Emma, Stars to Art, The Noodle Doodler, Muted Miami, Aaron Geddon, Doopy, Autumn Leaf, Red Mage Morgan, and Shake Her Hand. If you want to support the channel and get shout outs in videos like this, and get early access to videos, you'll find a link to the Patreon in the video description. Now on to FE4, whose most obvious contribution is the Weapon Triangle, a rock-paper-scissors-esque system where each weapon has an advantage of plus 20 accuracy against another weapon type, and a disadvantage of minus 20 accuracy against a different weapon. Swords do better against axes, axes do better against lances, and lances do better against swords. FE4 added a similar triangle for magic. In this game, wind magic has an advantage against thunder, Thunder has an advantage against fire, and fire has an advantage against wind. We also get two new types of magic here, light and dark. These sort of exist in FE1, 2, and 3. There are definitely tomes that feel dark magic or light magic coded, but they don't exist as their own separate weapon type until FE4. And wielders of these tomes are lucky because they have an advantage against fire, wind, and thunder magic. The magic triangle feels like less of a big deal in practice than it does on paper, mainly because there are a lot more physical enemies than magical enemies, and often you will be choosing to take out a squishy magic enemy with a physical unit that can take advantage of their low defense. So at least for me, my mages aren't spending a lot of their time fighting other mages, so it's pretty easy to sort of forget about the magic triangle. Mages in FE4 also suffer from severe not having a horse syndrome, at least when unpromoted. This was kind of true in FE1 and 3 as well, but strong mobility tools like warp and smaller maps meant it wasn't as annoying to get your mages where you wanted them to go in a reasonable time frame. In FE4, maps are huge, horses are fast, and movement staves aren't quite as strong as choosing a unit and sending them to any point on a map with an FE1 warp staff. This doesn't mean that mages can't contribute though, you just need to think carefully about how you're using them. If your horses are riding out to the first castle of a map, maybe start your mage on his way to the next castle. Then, when your horses finish castle 1, your mage and your other foot units will be at the next spot and ready to fight. Some mages like Azel promote into Mage Knight and pick up a horse, and once they do, they're some of my favorite units in the series, because magic can have great offense in this game, and a lot of enemies have low res. This is especially true later in the game when there are often big blocks of armor knights. There are solid tome options with good might, weight, and accuracy, and it's often hard to meet all three of those qualities with other 1-2 range weapons. So if you can get past the mobility issue or train a mage up to where they get a horse, they can be pretty big contributors. Of course, we can't talk about FE4 magic without talking about the Forseti Tome, which may be the most insane tome in the series. Forseti blesses its user with a whopping 20 speed and 10 skill just for holding it, and even better, it has 30 might. As long as you have a magic user that can wield it, Forseti will pretty much kill what you point it at. Even among the other legendary weapons in FE4, Forseti stands out, as few of them can make it as easy to double or are as accurate as this Wind Tome. So, FE4 is the game where magic can be powerful, but it's also limited by being placed on units who, at least at first, lag behind your fastest troops who often have good enough combat that you don't need to wait for a mage. But the game also provides a good payoff for using a mage in the Mage Knight promotion and the Forseti Tome. Next up is FE5, where we're going back to more normal-sized maps and powerful movement staves. There aren't any huge revelations for how magic works in this game, though it does have a weird quirk, and the actual magic units are pretty interesting. The weird quirk is that Thracia introduces Constitution as a stat that mitigates weapon weight, but only for non-tome weapons. So, a fighter with good con doesn't lose speed to most of their axes, but a mage always loses speed to their tomes. 
I don't really know why this is. Maybe the weight of tomes isn't meant to represent their literal weight, but rather the arduous process of casting a spell. It sort of makes sense to me that more difficult spells might be more difficult to cast, and thus reduce your speed more. That does make a bit more sense to me than the books just being literally heavier as they get stronger. But it's also possible that I'm overthinking this, and it was just a decision made to penalize mage speed a little bit. I couldn't find an answer to why they did this online, but if you know or have a theory, please drop it in the comments. While this weight system does penalize mages, the good news is that it doesn't hinder them much in part because good mages like Asbel and Homer have solid enough speed bases and great speed growths, but also because the Sage promotion in Thracia is insane. When you promote Asbel from Mage to Sage, he gains 5 magic, 5 skill, 6 speed, 4 defense, 1 con, and 1 move. Plus, he gets staff access. Homer's bonuses are a little different, but are similarly massive. So once either one of these guys promotes, they will be cooking for the rest of the game. And they're pretty good before promotion, too especially Asbel, who is a fantastic early combat unit due to his powerful PRF tome, Graph Caliber. Since enemies are often low res, Asbel can be an awesome boss killer with his 13 might, 100 hit, 40 crit, effective against flying units tome. And you don't even have to use it that sparingly, because you get Hamurn pretty early in Thracia. You may decide you want to save it for something else, but using it for more Graph Caliber charges isn't the worst thing in the world. The mages and sages in this game may lack horses, but it's not really a huge deal in Thracia because a lot of maps are indoors anyway, where units can't be on horses, mobility staves are really powerful for moving units around, and a lot of maps are escape all, where you're gonna have to walk your slowest unit to the escape point anyway. So being footlocked is not as big of a detriment as it was in FE4. I've mostly focused on mages here, and the other classes do not enjoy the same insane promotion bonuses. It's a bit of a bummer if you train Miranda to promotion, and instead of getting 5 magic and 6 speed, she gets 2 magic and 1 speed, and a horse when there's mostly indoor maps left anyway. The mage knights that join earlier you might have better luck with, Olwyn joins pretty underleveled, but Ilios is a pretty bangin' mage on a horse if that's something you want. Another cool thing about magic in Thracia is that it's pretty easy to get your hands on siege tomes by capturing enemy mages that have them. This has two positive effects. First, there's incentive to figure out how to deal with an enemy siege tome user instead of just baiting out all of their attacks. If you charge a siege tome user and just deal with them attacking you, you might be able to capture them and get your hands on two to three uses of their siege magic. Alternatively, if you don't want to go through that effort, it can be easier to just wait an enemy out and bait out all their siege tome uses but then you don't get to take it when you capture them. So I think there's a nice risk-reward here. If you do the more difficult task of rushing into Siege Tome range, you are rewarded with Siege Tome. But if you want an easier way out, you can bait the Tome instead, allowing you to progress but with less reward. I like the push and pull here, and Siege Tomes are just really fun to use. I think more games should give them to players more often. Their low durability keeps them from dominating too hard, but it's really fun to nuke an enemy from 10 spaces away. The last notable change in Thracia is that you actually get your own dark magic users in this game. Salem is the first to join your party, and being the first ever dark magic user makes him pretty memorable, even if dark tomes themselves aren't actually that exciting in Thracia due to their massive weight. So Thracia doesn't reinvent the wheel here with magic, but the different approach to map design allows magic units to shine more than an FE4, and the insane promotion bonuses for mages makes them exciting to use, you know, provided you're using one of the ones that gets to promote to Sage. After Thracia, we have the GBA era of magic. The core mechanics of 6, 7, and 8 are pretty similar for magic, so I'm lumping them together here, but I will touch on their differences as well. The most immediate difference for GBA magic systems versus the last couple is that units don't have both a strength and a magic stat like they did in FE4 and 5. They have one or the other. This is because no classes in the GBA games use both tomes and physical weapons unlike FE4 and 5, which had mage knights that use swords, as well as more common magical swords. Magical swords exist, but are fairly uncommon in GBA Fire Emblem, where they just work from the unit's strength, which is a little awkward, but it would have been weird to add a whole extra stat to every unit that would only come into play for a couple rare weapons. I think the consolidation of stats made sense here. In FE4 and 5, Wind, Thunder, and Fire were considered different weapon types with different weapon ranks for each mage, but in the GBA games, Fire, Thunder, and Wind are folded into a single magic type called Anima, and basic Wind Tomes are out. Instead, Wind appears only in less common tomes like Air Caliber in FE6 and Excalibur in FE7 and 8. 
of these tomes, only Air Caliber is flyer effective, so outside of Air Caliber and some S rank weapons, you don't get a ton of effective tomes in GBA FE. Dark and Light Magic continue their streak of appearances in the GBA games, and you get units that can use them in all three GBA games. These games also have a magic triangle made up of Light, Dark, and Anima Magic, but again, I found my mages were much more often fighting physical enemies than magic enemies, so the magic triangle didn't come up for me as often as I was expecting it to. FE6 has a slightly different dynamic for light magic in particular compared to 7 and 8 because you don't get any units that can use it at base until the very end of the game. Instead, if you want a way to use light magic sooner, you need to promote one of your staffers. On the other hand, in FE7 and 8, you are provided with a monk, which is an unpromoted class that can use light magic pretty early in the game. FE8 also made light magic accessible to sages, so it's pretty easy to get your hands on a unit that can use light magic in that game if you want to. In FE6, light magic isn't too exciting, generally sporting equal might to anima tomes of the same rank and lower accuracy. Which sort of makes sense when you consider what units can use light magic. It feels like it's meant more to be a sidearm for bishops when they find themselves in a pinch than a primary combat weapon. Sort of like Mercy pulling out her pistol in Overwatch. Anima tomes in FE6 feel mostly prized for their reliability, especially in the early game. Weapons can have shaky hit rates in FE6, but a fire tome has an accuracy of 95, 10 higher than even an iron sword. So in addition to being good against low res enemies, anima magic can be good when you just really need to hit an enemy. As for Dark Tomes, there aren't a ton of them in FE6, but it does bring Nosferatu in as a Dark Tome, which was a Light Tome in many previous games, and will be again later in the series. Beyond that, Dark Magic just isn't too exciting in this one. 7 doesn't make a ton of changes to the magic system of 6, but there are a few noteworthy adjustments. A lot of Tomes had their weight increased, such as Fire going from 1 weight to 4, and Thunder going from 2 weight to 6, and L Fire going from 4 weight to 10. In the early game, this doesn't feel like a huge deal because most units have more than 4 con to offset the weight of a fire tome, but especially when heavier tomes become more available, units are going to start losing some speed. Light and dark tomes similarly saw an increase in weight across the board, and they also got an accuracy boost. 7 also introduces some new tomes, most notably in the light and dark genres of magic. For light magic, a D rank tome Shine is added, as well as an A rank tome Ara. Dark Tomes make the most interesting addition in Luna. Luna is a Dark Tome with zero might, but the catch is that it ignores the target's resistance. This is great for if you want your Shaman to fight high-res enemies. High-res enemies that are scary are not the most common in FE7, but there are some and it's pretty fun to Luna nuke them. It's also a terror in the hands of enemy druids, because it's usually hitting for a decent amount of damage that you can't reduce. It also has 95 accuracy, so you can't reliably dodge it, and it's got 20 crit, so when you see a Luna Druid, that's your cue to approach carefully. Sacred Stones makes relatively fewer changes than 7 did to the magic system. Most tomes work identically or close to identically to the way they did in FE7, with some exceptions. Notably, Luna got a major nerf. Its crit was cut to 10 from 20, and its accuracy was reduced by 45 all the way down to 50. These changes basically make Luna a meme. In FE7, Luna Druids were pretty scary, but in 8, you can send a vaguely dodgy unit towards them, and they'll probably be fine. And even if they do get hit, at least the chance of a crit has been reduced. The biggest change to how magic works in this game is just the class system. Sages can use light magic now, and mages have the option to promote into Mage Knight. Troubadours now have Mage Knight as a promotion option, and Clerics have Valkyrie as a promotion option, so you have way more choices for your classes for your magic units than in previous GBA games. This mostly isn't that exciting though. Sages rarely, if ever, want to actually use their Light Tomes, and the only unit that gets to choose between Valkyrie and Mage Knight is Lara Shell, and she tends not to be a big combat unit since she usually promotes pretty late. Despite some changes, Magic doesn't feel too different in 8 versus previous GBA games. After the GBA era of Fire Emblem, we have Path of Radiance, which makes some pretty meaningful nerfs to Magic. Mainly, Magic Might is very low in this game. Fire is sitting on 3 Might, with L Fire at just 5, and Wind Tomes sport a pitiful base Might of 2. In theory, some of this could be made up for with effective damage. Wind Magic is effective against Flyers, and Fire is effective against Beast Lagoos but there are two problems. First, effective damage only doubles a weapon's might in FE9, and second, tome mites are low in this game. If you hit a flyer with a wind tome, you're still only getting four might out of the tome. To make matters worse, 
mages have armor knight movement in this game. Despite this, I still think mages have a niche. I made a whole video on this, but I'll give the cliff notes here. Shoving and rescue dropping are pretty available in a game where you don't need a ton of combat units and there are plenty of horses. Many enemies have low res in Path of Radiance, and tomes are also forgeable before hand axes and javelins are. This is pretty nice in the early game. For example, in Blood Runs Red, if you want to one round some of the calves with a javelin, you need 19 strength. On average, Marcia hits that at level 29. The armors on that chapter are even tougher to kill. However, the calves have 7 less resistance than defense, and tomes can be forged. So with a forged thunder, you only need 9 magic to kill the calf if you double. Ileana would hit that by level 10 unpromoted, though she won't actually have the speed to double the calves into level 16 on average. It's a similar story later in the game when javelins do become forgeable. There are still enemies like late game wyverns that are difficult to kill in one round with a forged javelin. And there's no better two range lance that you can forge. But you can kill these wyverns with a forged tome much more easily. Plus, mages get some unique utility out of siege tomes. Despite Tomes being low might, a trained mage does just fine offensively in Path of Radiance, and they can still one-round plenty of enemies. And through use of supports and maybe a robe, they can even be defensively better than you might think. The low move is a bigger problem though, and prevents mages from really competing with the best of the best units in FE9 in my eyes, as while there are some enemies that mages can kill that physical enemies struggle with, your physical units can still deal with plenty of enemies on their own, and with more bulk and mobility. Looking past the Tome Might and Move nerfs for magic users, we also have some more power neutral changes. We don't have any dark magic in this game, but we do have light magic, though it's only usable by Reese once he promotes. Additionally, anima magic is back to being split into three types with separate weapon ranks, Wind, Thunder, and Fire, which have their own weapon triangle. Light magic exists outside of this triangle and behaves neutrally towards anima magic. Nosferatu is also back to being a light magic spell in this game, Presumably just because we don't get a dark magic user. Luna, on the other hand, is gone, for better or for worse. Additionally, while separate stats for magic and strength went away in the GBA games, it returns in Path of Radiance. Strength is mainly relevant for mages in that it offsets weapon weight in Path of Radiance, similar to the way Khan did in the GBA games. So especially in the early game and potentially into the later game, getting a point of strength is sort of like getting a point of speed for mages. I don't love the strength offsetting weight system overall for reasons that I discussed in my weapon weight video, but I do like the effect it has on mages specifically. It's neat that mages care a little bit but not overwhelmingly about strength, instead of it just being a useless stat. It can act as a small differentiator between different mages as well. Ileana having a 25% strength growth compared to Soren's 5% means that she can get some extra speed gains by hitting strength and having fewer weight problems but she has to deal with a slightly worse speed growth than Soren as a result. It's just something that helps give a little flavor to two units that are similar in many other ways. Hypothetically, mages can also make use of strength on promotion because when they promote they get to choose between getting daggers as a new weapon type or staves. You should probably take the staves. Your sage will likely do zero damage to most enemies with daggers, but if you hit a bunch of strength levels and you want to meme around, dagger sages are technically an option. All of the pre-promoted sages have knives instead of staves, which I think is actually a cool design choice. It gives you a reward for training your own mage in that you can choose the better weapon type for them upon promotion. If you want a staff sage though, you're going to have to train your own. While I am an FE9 magic defender, I do not have as much of a defense for mages in the next game, Radiant Dawn. FE10 tome mites are up from 9, but still aren't tremendously high compared to physical weapons. On the upside, effectiveness is up to 3 times in this game, which is great, especially with the higher tome mites. The tomes that are effective against wyverns have also changed. In FE9 it was wind, and it's thunder in FE10. But magic faces a new challenge in FE10, which is that if enemies forgot to bring a res stat in a lot of previous games, they sure didn't in this one, a lot of enemies have decent to good res. With all that in mind, I would say that FE10 mages have fewer moments where they can really shine compared to previous games. Some that jump to mind are Ileana and Tormod in the Dawn Brigade. Ileana can provide solid combat in a few chapters when the Dawn Brigade is really wanting for good units, while Tormod is one of the strong units that you get to bolster the weaker Dawn Brigade scrubs. Sadly, he's not around for very long, and both Ileana and Tormod are a lot less exciting after Part 1. 
Later game mages stand out less. When we return to the Dawn Brigade, we get Soren, and he is useful, but he's pretty overshadowed by the cracked and jacked units that are the rest of the Dawn Brigade, so it's hard to get too excited about him. Something that is cool about magic in FE10 is that it added a lot of new tomes. Since we have a light magic lord in Micaiah, we of course get a magic rapier in the form of Thanny. And all tome types got a few new additional weapons since weapons go past S rank and into SS rank in this game. So we see a wide variety of tomes here that you don't see in most games, though they don't really have many exciting properties beyond the SS tomes providing small stat bonuses. Radiant Dawn also introduced the Arc line of spells, which returned in Awakening to act as a step up from the L line of spells. The game also has Dark Mages, unlike Path of Radiance, though players only get two units that can use it, and only on a second playthrough. I'm not going to say who they are, because it is a spoiler. If you know, you know, but if you don't, well, better get to playing your second run of Radiant Dawn, huh? For me, Radiant Dawn is the weakest magic has felt in the series. It still has its uses, and Tormod in particular feels pretty great for a couple chapters in Part 1. But the moments for magic to sparkle feel fewer and further between than anything that comes before or after. Next up is DS Fire Emblem, and as is common with these videos, I'm going to go into a little more detail on 11 than 12. Sorry, I've only played 12 a couple times, and my hard 3 playthrough is continuing to make slow progress. In FE11, the stats for magic work similarly to the last couple games. Strength and magic are split, and strength offsets weapon weight. Most of the units that start in mage have a stone cold 0 for their strength growth, but since this is a game with reclassing, you could get a mage with a strength growth by reclassing a character with good personal strength, though most of the units with good strength growths have zeros in magic. There's only a small selection of units that have more than a 5% personal growth in both strength and magic, so unless you're okay with a mage with low magic growths, your mages probably aren't going to grow strength much, if at all. Though they will get some from their promotion gains, which is nice. The magic weapon triangle from previous games goes away here, and I was fine with that. Most of the time mages aren't fighting other mages, so it was something that was rarely super impactful and easy to forget about on occasions where it did come up. Given that this is a remake of FE1, you would expect the available tomes to be pretty similar, and you would be correct. They are exactly the same. The stats are even very close to each other, with the biggest differences being in weight. What's sort of interesting about the weights between FE11 and FE1 is that the changes aren't uniform. FE11's Fire and Thunder Tome are heavier compared to FE1, but FE11's Bolganon and Thoron are both lighter than FE1's version. This is interesting to me because in FE11, mages also get to offset some of that weight with the strength they gain on promotion. So I would have expected weights to be similar, or maybe even a little higher in FE11 now that there's some weight mitigation. I assume that this change was made because in FE1 it's pretty rough trying to double with Bolganon and Thoron, so they wanted to alleviate that a little bit. And it would have been even tougher in FE11 since the enemies are higher quality and the doubling threshold is now 4 instead of 1 like it was in FE1. The most interesting change item-wise is actually with some of the PRF weapons. In FE1 and 3 Book 1, there were two noteworthy PRF tomes, the Excalibur Tome, which was exclusive to Merrick, and the Aura Tome, which was exclusive to Linda. This changes in Shadow Dragon... kind of. In this game, Excalibur can be used by Merrick at any weapon level, but other male mages can use it once they have a weapon rank of B. This is a nice boon for Wendell, who joins not long after Merrick and can use Excalibur at base. But this doesn't mean you'll just hand it to Wendell and let Merrick languish. Wendell wants to spend some time building staff rank, you might make him a wyvern for a chapter, or he might just be on warping duty sometimes, and in those cases, or in cases where you want two mages, Merrick using his special tome is still a great option. Aura is a similar story. Linda can use it at E rank tomes, and other female mages can use it at B rank tomes. This is a more favorable situation for Linda than Merrick's situation, though, because while we have Wendell who can easily use Excalibur, Shadow Dragon does not give us any women mages besides Linda by default. So unless you reclassed a woman unit into mage and grinded up her tome rank, Linda is going to be the only one that can use her tome. I'm not huge on this change to the PRF tomes. I really like how PRFs can set units apart, and removing exclusive access to Excalibur from Merrick doesn't lift up any units that struggled in previous games, it just makes Wendell, who was already a great unit in the previous games, even a little bit better. Which, speaking of Wendell, insane unit. How many units can you say are arguably S tier in four different Fire Emblem games? He's not even bad in FE12, although he doesn't shine as much in that game as he does in the previous centuries. I just feel like we should be talking more about how insanely consistently good this old man is. 
Getting back to magic though, it's also worth noting that FE11 adds playable dark mages that we didn't have in FE1, though you can only get one by either reclassing a unit or playing an optional guide in chapter late in the game where we can recruit the pre-promoted sorcerer Etzel. Dark mages don't feel super special in this game though, there were no new dark tomes added, so they use the same weapons as mages. Dark mages do come with a higher defense base though, so if you want a mage with some early bulk, it's an alright option. For me, FE11 is a game largely defined by effective weaponry, so I get most of my mage use out of Excalibur on Wendell and Merrick, which is great for taking down flyers, and Aura can be okay with its super high might if you want to train up Linda. Other than that, I tend to use my mages in more of a filler capacity for fighting Arbor Knights when I don't have a hammer around, or in the early game when being able to chip without taking a counterattack is very valuable. I usually make pretty heavy use of warp when I play Shadow Dragon though, and I suspect that I might like mages even more if I didn't since I would value their ability to attack safely on a larger number of maps. So plenty of differences in FE11 compared to our FE1 mages, but the enemy mages are also notably different in FE11 and they can be a lot scarier because unlike FE1, there is a magic stat, but non-mages still have very low resistance growth so they can hit your physical units hard. The other DS game, FE12, does not seem that different from FE11 on the surface, the stat system is actually a little bit different for mages though. The strength magic split is still present, but strength no longer offsets weight because weight isn't in this game. So mages have a strength stat, but they really don't care about it. FE12 also makes more changes to its tomes compared to FE3 than FE11 did compared to FE1. Tomes often have slightly different weights and might, such as Shaver being 7 might in FE12 compared to 5 in FE3 which is nice since that extra might gets multiplied against the flyers that Shaver is effective on. We also see a couple new tomes in this game. Ember makes its first appearance in this game before appearing again in Fates later. It's basically a joke weapon, you get it from the How's Everyone events between chapters and it's just fire with less might. From the same event, you can get Yuru Blizzard, which is a bit of an odd tome. It has one less might than a Thunder Tome with the same accuracy, but it's got 10 crit, so nothing outstanding, but you could use it as a filler tome or for if you want to gamble on crits. And the last tome you can get from this event is Katarina's Book, and that is the banger tome from this event. It has 11 might, so more than most readily available tomes, especially in the early game, but less than some of the rarer ones, and it also has 90 accuracy, making it more reliable than something like Bolganone, which has one more might at the cost of 20 less hit. So it's a pretty good tome, but you aren't guaranteed to get any copies of it since it comes from an RNG-based event. We also see the return of Nosferatu in FE12 after it was missing in FE11, so that was neat. In my couple of playthroughs of FE12, mages have felt pretty good. Linda joining in Chapter 3 with Ara feels so much better than her joining a little underleveled in the mid-game in FE11. And FE12 has a lot of flyers which can make Shaver a nice tool for mages, and Excalibur is a great tool for the mages that can use it. Magic again feels like a real asset in FE12, especially against some of the very scary enemies that you'd rather not take a counterattack from. Now we move from the DS to the 3DS with Awakening, and I feel like this is a game where magic is very iconic for a few reasons. First, we have a magic lord in Robin, and while our last magic lord, Micaiah, can have some struggles with combat long term, Robin is very easy to make into an offensive powerhouse, and based on how people talk about the game, it's extremely common that people do make Robin an offensive powerhouse. The reputation of Awakening has sometimes been that the easiest way to beat it is to solo it with Krom and Robin, or failing that, Nosferatu tanking with Tharja. I don't think this is actually true, but it speaks to how highly people think of magic in this game, and I'll go into a little more detail about this after going into the basics of the magic system. Stat-wise, we keep the same strength magic split from the last couple games, and there's no weight, so it feels a lot like FE12. Though unlike FE12, Awakening actually has classes that can use both physical weapons and tomes, so strength is not a completely useless stat for all of your mages. In fact, Robin actually starts out with access to swords and tomes, and for non-lord units, Dark Knight and Dark Flyer both have access to tomes and a physical weapon type. Though I don't actually find that units in these classes tend to use both weapon types that often, usually if I promote a physical unit into Dark Flyer, I stick to them using lances most of the time. Well, if I promote a magic unit into Dark Knight, I have them use tomes most of the time. Awakening doesn't sport a magic weapon triangle, but it does differentiate between anima and dark tomes. All magic classes can use anima tomes, which make up most of the game's tomes, but only dark mages and the promoted dark mage sorcerer can use dark tomes. 
The main differentiator for Dark Magic is usually that either it does more damage than Anima alternatives at the same rank, at the cost of lower accuracy, such as Flux having 2 more might than Thunder but 10 less hit, or if a Dark Tome doesn't have more might, it usually has some neat effect that Anima Tomes don't offer, such as Waste being capable of hitting up to 4 times, or Nosferatu restoring the user's health for half the damage they dealt. And we will talk about Nosferatu more later, it's a big deal in this game. Sorcerers get the option of using these neat dark magic effects while still having access to anima spells, while other magic classes trade the lack of access to dark tomes for features like access to a second weapon type or a mount on promotion. Generally, I think this choice is interesting enough. I don't use a ton of Dark Knight, but I use Sorcerer Sage and Dark Flyer pretty often in my Awakening playthroughs, so I think they struck a decent balance here. Looking at some of Awakening's tomes, while it doesn't have a magic triangle, it does have three distinct genres of anima magic, Fire, Thunder, and Wind. Though all are governed by just one weapon rank for tomes, which also includes Dark Magic for units that can use it. The main difference between the anima magics is just their stats. Wind has the lowest might but highest accuracy, and has effectiveness against flying enemies. Thunder has the most might and lowest accuracy, plus some crit. And Fire is the middle ground between the two. All three have tomes for every weapon rank, including the Arc line of tomes, which returns from Radiant Dawn as the C-rank anima tomes in this game. I like Wind tomes being effective against Flyers, but I do feel like Fire, Thunder, and Wind all feel pretty similar in this game. So there's just a ton of tomes, but they don't feel that different. Nothing really stands out from each other. But if you're looking for an exciting tome, Awakening does bring some new spells in, many of which are callbacks to old characters, such as Micaiah's Pyre or Selica's Gale. These spells are pretty disgusting if you get them early on, which you can from Sparkle Tiles if you're lucky, especially Selica's Gale since it only requires C-rank magic. A-rank tomes include some legendary tomes from the series past as well, such as Forseti and Volflame, so if you've played the series up to this point, there's some cute references here. Alright, so after that, why is Magic, and specifically Nosferatu, so popular in Awakening? I think there's a few reasons. One, the Nosferatu effect is very powerful. Getting half the damage you deal back in healing is great. Second, the great healing from Nosferatu is compounded by Awakening giving you more ways to make a mage tougher and stronger than in previous entries. Historically, most mages, with a couple exceptions, struggle to Juggernaut either because they have low bulk so they die if they fight a lot of enemies, or because magic doesn't do enough damage to reliably one-round enemies like in FE1. In Awakening, these problems are very easily solved. Damage just isn't a huge issue, the good magic units will all have great magic stats, Tome Mites are respectable, and if you need some extra oomph, you can forge or use tonics. Additionally, pair up is a big help both for offense and defense. Pair up can give you extra magic when you need it, plus the ability to get a dual strike from your partner. Add to this any chance you have to proc a skill or get a crit, and this adds up to a lot of opportunities for extra damage and a lot of ways to one round enemies. Defensively, pair ups can add bulk through extra defense, and dual guard provides a chance for enemies to deal no damage to you in addition to whatever your avoid chance was. And this protection really just has to stop you from getting one shot because Nosferatu can make sure you recover the damage you take from any single enemy before you fight the next one. I think that's why it's such a popular option for juggernauting in Awakening. Robin is a common choice for this job because they're around from the start of the game, get extra EXP from kills, and have those early maps to build up some supports with Krom. Nosferatu tanking with a paired up Krom and Robin is sometimes talked about as the easiest way to beat the game, but I'm not sure that's quite right. You can make similarly effective 1 2 ranged juggernauts with Soul and a Hand Axe, for example, and those become available way before Nosferatu, and cost you less to buy. This isn't to say Nosferatu tanking isn't powerful, obviously it is. But I think Awakening gets boiled down to Nosferatu tanking too much when there are other options that you can pursue. Overall, Awakening expands the magic system with a lot of new classes, new tomes, and new options for bulking up mages that we haven't seen before. And it's a system I mostly like. I think there are reasons to use most of the magic classes, all of them have something exciting about them, whether it be Sage's staff access for big rescues, Dark Flyer's long-term prospects of Gale Force, or Sorcerer's access to Dark Tomes. Sorry to leave you out, Dark Knight, I'm afraid I just don't find myself using you that much. The next Fire Emblem game on the 3DS was Fates, which, like 12, is a game I don't play a ton of, though I've got a few playthroughs of each route under my belt. This will definitely be among the sections where my takes will be a little less informed. 
The immediately obvious change for Fates is magic being divided into two groups, scrolls from Hoshido and tomes from Nor. The main difference between the two is just going to be which one is more common in the route you're playing. Tomes are more readily available in Conquest, scrolls are more available in Birthright. But they're both governed by the same weapon rank, and any class that can use one can also use the other. There are some mechanical differences between the common versions of scrolls and tomes, though. Scrolls are typically slightly statistically worse than tomes of the same rank, usually losing out on a little bit of hit, but they offer their wielder a small bonus to their stats. So a Thunder Tome and an Ox Spirit Scroll have the same might, but Thunder has 5 more hit, and Ox Spirit gives its user plus 1 defense. There are larger differences between the more rare scrolls and tomes that make them less directly comparable, but a trend is that scrolls often give you some form of stat boost while tomes are more likely to have some special effect, like Nosferatu draining health, Lightning having a brave effect, or Mjolnir making crits deal more damage. This isn't a hard and fast rule though. Some scrolls have effects like Calamity Gate flipping the weapon triangle, and some tomes just impact stats like Ophelia's Mistletane. Speaking of Calamity Gate and the weapon triangle, there's no magic triangle in this game, but magic is part of the normal weapon triangle. Specifically, they live in the red portion of the triangle, giving them advantage versus axes and bows, and disadvantage versus lances and throwing weapons. This is the first time that magic has just lived in the weapon triangle, and I kind of like it. I think the red-blue-green system for Weapon Triangle is really easy to understand, and because you use it all the time, it's not easy to forget like the Magic Triangle in older games. And being in the Weapon Triangle doesn't make Magic feel less unique, because it still has properties that aren't shared by other weapons most of the time, such as hitting on res or providing good offense at 1-2 range. 1-2 range is something that helps Magic units stand out in Fates, because Fates nerfed 1-2 physical range weapons pretty heavily. Hand axes and javelins can't double, and they can't proc skills or crit either. Tomahawks and spears aren't even 1-2 range anymore, they're just 2 range. In contrast, magic can crit and proc skills, it can double, and it gets to higher mites than the commonly available physical 1-2 range weapons can offer. And with more accuracy to boot. As a result, magic is one of the better options if you want a unit to be a great enemy phaser and they weren't blessed with a special 1-2 range weapon like Ryoma was. They compete mainly with ninjas for this role, who can also do the job quite well. So, Magic is capable of playing a great role on your team, and Fates also introduces some new classes that I think are really interesting. I'm not going to talk about all of the new classes, but I am going to talk about a couple that are pretty interesting to me. Starting with my favorite Magic class in Fates, the Oni Chieftain, which is a physically bulky class that promotes from the club-wielding Oni Savage. We really haven't had that many bulky mage classes that the player gets access to up to this point in the series, and I thought it was pretty novel. You can use that extra bulk to be a little more aggressive with your positioning on an Oni Chieftain than you could be on a less bulky mage, plus they pick up Death Blow at level 5 to give them plus 20 crit. It's a pretty unique class for a mage that I have a lot of fun with each Birthright playthrough, especially because I really like Rinka. Similarly unique to Fates is the Basara class, which uses Lances and Tomes. It's got a big bulk lead and magic deficit compared to Onmyoji, which is the other choice for units promoting from Diviner. The thing that drew me to this class the first time I played Fates was its level 5 skill, Rend Heaven, which is a bit of an odd one. It's a proc skill, and when it activates, it increases your damage by either half the target's strength if you're using a physical weapon, or half the target's magic when using a magic weapon. So that's cool, but it's hard to rely on a proc rate, and it's unfortunate for tome-focused Basaras that they can only get significant bonus Rend Heaven damage with magic weapons against mages who tend to have higher res stats, and thus aren't the best target for magic damage. Using Rend Heaven against physical enemies with a tome generally won't get you a ton of bonus damage. Fortunately, Basaras do get something to help with at least the proc rate part when they reach level 15, Quixotic. This is another odd skill that increases your hit rate by 30 and your skill proc rate by 15, which is great, but it also does the same thing for your opponent. That might sound bad, but it's honestly not too big of a deal to work around. You can attack enemies that can't hit you back, or send your Basara at enemies that don't have proc skills, which is a lot of them, or if you're feeling lucky, just stack up a bunch of proc skills and assume you'll kill the enemy before they kill you. Probably not the best strategy, but it's pretty fun and a pretty unique take on a magic class. I hadn't really used a unit like a Basara before I played Fates. 
Nora brings a new magic class of its own as well in the Malignite, which is a wyvern promotion that uses axes and tomes, and it's as good as it sounds. This class is somewhat well known for being the class Camilla arrives in, but it's also a good magic class for lots of units if they can get into it. When I do Magic Corrin, I often have them spend a lot of time in Malignite. To me, Malignite feels better than something like Dark Flyer and Awakening because Fates is loaded with maps where flying is a big deal, like Fuga's Wild Ride, Hinoka's map with the flying speed boost Dragon Veins, and the Eternal Stairway. And while its skills aren't as flashy as Gale Force, I get some use out of Savage Blow and Trample is active a lot since there's tons of non-mounted enemies in Conquest. It's a good class in a very straightforward way. It also feels worth noting that this game dialed back Nosferatu compared to Awakening. It can't double, and it can't activate skills or crit. When Fates came out, a lot of people, including myself, kind of wrote it off, but it turns out that you can still get some pretty solid usage out of it, particularly it can make Odin pretty bulky in the early game. You just need to be a little more thoughtful with it in Fates than running a juiced up sorcerer into a mob of enemies and hoping they come out fine. Magic in Fates is neat. The weapon triangle including magic was a change that I liked a lot, it was a good way to spice up the game. The nerf to 1-2 to two physical ranged weapons really helps carve out a niche for magic units to shine as well, and I particularly like the new Hoshiden promoted magic classes that give us a bit of a different kind of magic unit that we haven't had before in the series. Our last 3DS game is Fire Emblem Echoes, which is another remake, this time of Gaiden. And the magic system in Echoes is very much modeled off of Gaiden's. No weapon triangle, resistance growths are back to being non-existent, and spells come from spell lists instead of tomes and cost health to cast. If you played Fire Emblem Gaiden, you're going to feel right at home in Echoes, but you probably didn't, in which case this is going to feel like a pretty fresh magic system. And there were some changes to Echo's magic system from Gaiden. One is that some spells work a little differently. Gaiden only had one 1-3 one range spell in Thunder, while Echo's offers a second one in Sagitte. Nosferatu also got an extra 10 hit in Echo's, which is great because it's still not that accurate, so imagine how inaccurate it was in Gaiden. Another thing that kind of changes the dynamic of magic in Echo's is the Pitchfork, which is free DLC that lets you reclass anyone into a villager and this means that you can easily get any unit into Mage if you want them to. Each character has their own list of spells they learn as they level up, so making an unusual unit into a Mage to see what spells they get can be fun. Some of them are surprising, like Saber being the only unit besides Celica to get Sagitte as early as level 5 Mage. Another good change in Echoes was the reduction of the promotion level for female Mages. In Gaiden, women Mages don't promote until level 20, 8 higher than male Mages who promote at 12. In Echoes, women mages can promote at level 14, which is still too higher than male mages, but it's so much better than having to wait until level 20 to promote Mei. I don't have too much to add on this one that I didn't already talk about in the Gaiden section. It's a good modernization of Gaiden's magic system while keeping most of that system's bones in place, and it's great that magic feels very special and unique in this game compared to physical weapons. Fire Emblem Three Houses is our first game on the Switch, and it feels like it takes a lot of notes from Gaiden and Echoes. It's another game with no weapon triangle and spell lists return here. The spells are even divided into Reason and Faith in a way that is similar to the black and white magic split from Gaiden. Three Houses is a game with very customizable units, so naturally anybody can become a mage, so everybody has a spell list. Though it's worth noting that some spell lists are way better than others. You can make Caspar a mage if you want, but he sure isn't going to learn too many spells. I have mixed feelings about this. On one hand, I like my characters having unique spell lists that set them apart from one another, and I don't inherently mind characters having certain aptitudes for certain classes, and a lack of aptitude in others. It doesn't really bother me that, say, Dorothea is better than Petra as a mage, and that Petra is better in physical classes than Dorothea. But I think it's easier to work around deficiencies in physical classes than magic in a way that's fun. If I put Dorothea in a physical class, I can always give her a bunch of stat boosters and forge her weapons, and I can make her a combat god if I want to that performs as you would expect a physical unit to. But this doesn't work the same way with mages. No matter how much I favor Petra, she's never going to learn Meteor. So I wish that at least each unit had three spells on both their Reason and Faith lists. That would still put them behind characters that get four or five spells, but it wouldn't feel as bad to use a unit that isn't well suited to being a mage in a magical class as it does currently in Three Houses. Alternatively, it could have been cool if there was a way to alter a unit's spell list. Being able to teach a unit a spell would have been on theme for the game and would have been a fun way to personalize your units a bit more. 
Still, despite my quibble here, there are plenty of good to great mage options in three houses, and the spell lists really do help to differentiate them. Lysithia feels distinct for her early access to dark magic that makes her well-suited to nuking heavy enemies like armors or even the Death Knight, and Dorothea's meteor access allows her to play a long-range support role in a way that Lysithia can't. Another new thing in Three Houses is the resource used to cast magic. There's no tomes, so you don't have to worry about durability, and they don't cost HP to cast like they do in Echoes. Instead, characters just have a number of times they can cast each spell on their list per map, and that number will increase as the character grows. You tend to get more casts of your weaker spells and less casts of your stronger spells, so you might have 8 casts of Fire for a map and only 1 or 2 of Bulganone. This has a few effects. The thing I like most about it is that it really makes magic feel distinct from weapons, which is something Echo succeeded at as well, but many other Fire Emblem games struggle with where magic can feel just like other weapons. In Three Houses, magic feels completely like its own system, even beyond the aesthetics of the weapon. It doesn't feel like your Grammarie and Warmaster are fighting in a similar way mechanically, and I really like that. This spells per map system will also influence how the player sees resource management. In my experience, the system discourages hoarding. You know your spells are going to get replenished next map anyway, so there's not as much pressure to save a good spell in case you need it later. You are incentivized to make sure you use your best spells though, because it feels like a waste to finish a map having cast 8 fires and 0 bolganones. On the other hand, the system also means that players don't really need to think about conserving their resources and can go all out every fight, which can be a pro or a con depending on your perspective. In FE8, for example, you might not use Excalibur for every combat. Maybe you want to save some uses for Morva and Faux Mortis later in the game. That decision making is less present in Three Houses. For the offensive reason magic, I think this is a bigger pro than a con. It's really fun to be able to use your powerful spells often, and none of them feel game breaking. Powerful white magic spells replenishing each map feels a little more problematic, being able to warp every map is pretty strong, but I don't want to get into that too much since I said I wasn't going to talk about staves or staff adjacent magic in this one. For reason magic though, I think this system's fantastic. I love being able to cast meteor every single map. The last thing I want to touch on for three houses is dark magic. I mentioned dark magic earlier when I was talking about Lysithia, and most units don't get dark magic in three houses by default. But using one of the seals you get from the Death Knight, you can class change specifically a male unit into Dark Mage. I really don't know why this is limited to male units. There are women that learn Dark Magic, and it's not more common among the men's spell lists. Maybe it's just because Grammarie is women only? I don't really have a ton to say about this class. It seems very unremarkable to me. But I just find it very weird, so I wanted to bring it up. You can only access it through a special seal, only men can enter it, and it's really easy to forget about. Just a weird little class. I really appreciate Three Houses taking creative risks with magic, I love how distinct it feels from other weapon types, and I mostly like how the casts per map system plays out instead of durability, or a health cost for spells like in Echoes. This is a magic system I would love to come back sometime, I like it in this game, and I think there's so much room for new ideas and iteration. Spell lists in particular feel like a great way to differentiate mages, and I would like to see it back sometime. And last but not least for magic systems, we have Engage, which returns to more of a traditional magic system. No more spell lists in this one, tomes are back to being items like normal weapons, and there's no durability for offensive spells, while white magic from previous games are mostly staves with durability now. Tomes being items again also means that they are once again eligible to be forged or receive an engrave, which is one of Engage's new features for buffing weapons. The tome selection feels very classic, we see Wind, Fire, and Thunder here, and I really like how Engage differentiated the three. I complained earlier that in some games they just don't feel super distinct from one another, but that's not the case in Engage. In this game, Wind Tomes weigh you down less than other tomes and offer effective damage against Flyers, Fire Tomes offer the best damage for 1-2 range combat, and Thunder Tomes have high might and 1-3 range but can't double. It reminds me a bit of Echoes, but with more spells for players to make use of and not limited to specific units since there aren't spell lists. Every unit has the option of hopping into Mage and picking up 1-3 to three range Thunder. I usually find some use for all three types of tomes in my playthroughs, though I definitely use Fire Magic the most and Wind Magic the least. We also get some new tomes in Engage. The one that jumps out to me the most is Surge, a 1 range spell with good might and extremely high accuracy. I don't find myself using these tomes too often, but they're great for if you really want to make an attack reliable. 
which is a legitimate niche for the cost of having to attack at one range instead of two or three. The different tomes in Engage also feel like they support different playstyles and types of units nicely. If you want to make a magical carry, you'll probably put a unit in Mage Knight and have them try to double and one round enemies with Fire Tomes or Eleven Sword. But if you have a magic unit you don't want to invest in as much, you can throw them in Sage, hand them a Thunder Tome, and they can provide solid chip damage at minimal cost. Nice. Engage doesn't have any super unique magical classes that I want to talk about. Ivy's Magical Wyvern class is awesome, but I don't have a ton to say about it that I didn't say about Malignite and Fates. Turns out putting a Tome on a Wyvern is good. Who knew? Emblem Rings are Engage's big new feature though, and I do want to talk about those. By equipping an Emblem Ring to a unit, we can give them an injection of stats, skills, and a special Engage attack. There's a couple I want to talk about that feel particularly cool for mages. The first is the Celica Ring, which seems basically designed for magic users. She gives you a nice magic boost, some new magic tomes you can use while engaged, and the ability to attack twice per turn at half damage. I particularly like that last one because it's an ability you kind of need to think about how to use to get the most value out of it. You could have a mage use it to chip two enemies on the same turn, or attack twice to activate any available chain attack partners twice in a single turn, or you could use it to break an enemy's chain guard while still being able to attack again, or use it on a poisoned enemy to get the bonus damage from poison in extra time in a turn. You don't get much out of it if you don't plan around how you're going to use it, but it's rewarding and fun to think about how to get the most value out of it, particularly in the early game. I love skills like that, I think they're a little more fun than flat bonuses to attacks or stats. Celica is also kind enough to provide us with the Seraphim Tome, which is effective against corrupted enemies, of which there are many. It's particularly good in the late game if you upgrade it. The piece de resistance for Celica, though, is her Engage Attack, Warp Ragnarok, which does exactly what it says on the tin. It allows your Celica user to warp across the map and hit an enemy with a powerful magic attack. The attack is awesome in the early game and falls off a little bit later, but having a warp that doesn't cost you any staff uses and that can be used by anyone, even non-magic units, is awesome. Celica's a pretty easy to understand emblem. You slap her on a magic unit, they'll do more damage, and they can warp in to fight the boss at the end of the map. What's not to like? There aren't too many other emblems that feel tailor-made specifically for mages, but there are some emblems that really benefit mages. Corrin is one who allows mages to debuff enemies from far away by combining the Draconic Hex skill with three ranged Thunder Tomes, and the Erika emblem is great too, which provides the Bravery skill that gives a flat 3 to 5 damage that can help mages get to one rounding thresholds. I also want to touch on one DLC emblem, Sorin, who is one of my favorites to use, specifically because he gives you access to the Siege Tome Bolting. It's a pretty limited bolting at 2 might and 50 hit, and since it's an engaged weapon you can't engrave it and the upgrade materials are sparse if you don't use online features. But having easy access to a siege tome every map is really fun. It's pretty easy to stack up accuracy bonuses via supports and skills to make up for its low hit, and you can give it to a high magic unit like Citrine to make up for some of its low might. Then, between rallies and refreshes, there's tons of enemy units that you can nuke from 10 spaces away with bolting. It's definitely not the easiest way to deal with engaged maps, but I've wanted to be able to spam bolting ever since I first played FE7, so I'm glad Engage gave me the opportunity to do so. Beyond the emblems and tomes, magic mostly feels pretty good in Engage because a lot of enemies have pretty low resistances. I'll throw a few examples on screen, but there are a lot of maps where the one rounding thresholds for magic units are a bit lower than for physical units, which combined with tomes offering more might at 1-2 range than other weapon types, makes them a nice option if you want to do a bunch of enemy phase 1-2 ranging. But there are still tons of enemies that you're going to have an easier time fighting with physical weapons, and even some maps where it's easier to hit one rounding thresholds with physical weapons than magic. So tomes feel strong and like an important part of your team, but I don't find that they feel over-centralizing. I think tomes play pretty nicely in Engage, but I sort of miss them feeling mechanically distinct from other weapon types like they do in Three Houses and Echoes, but I do appreciate that Engage takes some steps to differentiate tomes from other weapon types through different synergies with emblems, as well as relatively unique tome properties like 1-3 to three range Thunder Tomes or the incredibly accurate Surge Tome. Mage-specific synergies and special tome effects feel like a good way to make magic feel a little magical, if you're going to go the traditional item system route for magic instead of spell lists like in Three Houses and Gaiden. Alright, that's all of the magic in the series. This video ended up being way longer than I expected to be, script kinda got away from me on this one, but I hope you enjoyed it, or at least used the chapters to jump around to the games you wanted to hear about. 
If you did enjoy it, consider leaving a like or subscribe so that you don't miss the next upload, and if you want to chat about Fire Emblem more, consider hopping in the community Discord. You'll find it linked in the video description. Either way, thank you for hanging out, and I hope you have a lovely week.